celluloid and silicon. And today I'm going to be talking about Hellraiser Judgment, which came out on video yesterday. Uh, actually, video on demand, DVD, and Blu-ray. This is a direct-to-video endeavor. Uh, this was not released theatrically, and in fact, no Hellraiser film has been released theatrically since 1996's Bloodline. And uh, I can tell you, I'm an enthusiast of horror. I've been a horror fan since I was very young, and out of all the horror franchises, Hellraiser has always been my favorite. And I've been with this franchise since the very beginning. And those of you out there who share my enthusiasm will know that um, those of us that are Hellraiser fans, we've had to suffer through a lot of indignities. This is not a franchise that has been treated well uh, by its owners, uh, specifically uh, and namely Dimension, who have really, for the last uh, better part of 20 years, have regulated Hellraiser to kind of the bargain bin, straight-to-video um, niche, and basically have been selling these movies uh, and scraping the bottom of the barrel, both in terms of budget and promotion. All the while, we've all kind of been sitting around and waiting for a reboot or a relaunch of this franchise to happen on a larger scale, and of course that just really hasn't happened. So Bloodline was the last film released theatrically, and then after that we had these straight-to-video films, and none of them have been very good. Uh, the very first one was a film called Hellraiser Inferno, and the basically, according to production rumors, uh, the film was not a Hellraiser film. It was some other detective, surreal, noir type of thing that uh, they basically uh, kind of attached Pinhead to at the very end. And if you've seen the film, you know that Pinhead's in the film. I think in, he's in the movie for all of maybe about five or ten minutes. Um, Hellseeker came out after that. Hellseeker was probably, in my opinion, the best direct-to-video uh, Hellraiser film. Uh, it got a lot of... Um, I got a lot of um, mileage from the fact that uh, Ashley Lawrence, who played Christy Cotton in the first two films, uh, kind of made her return. And it was the same kind of thing. I mean, it was one of these movies where there was a lot going on, and then she kind of popped up, and her husband pops up, and then Pinhead kind of shows up at the end. It wasn't a, a straight-laced Hellraiser film. And then the, the other two, uh, Deader uh, and Hellworld, are both just atrocious films. And... Um, Again, a complete waste of time, energy, uh, resources. The only thing good about those films, the only reason that you would even consider watching those films as a Hellraiser fan is because for the, the, the brief times that Bradley shows up, he does Pinhead, he does it remarkably well. Uh, he's one of those people who uh, he commands a certain presence and he is iconic even when he's in a lousy film. But other than that, there's no reason to watch those films. Uh, they're quite bad. So then that brings us to... Uh, Revelations. Now, Revelations came out in 2011, and if you don't know anything about Revelations or its background, it was an Ashcan film. And an Ashcan film is basically a movie that's made by a studio because they are contractually obligated to put out a film by a certain time or they can actually lose the rights to the intellectual property. Um, this has happened, uh, there, actually probably one of the most famous examples was the Roger Corman Fantastic Four film. That, that film was literally made by Roger Corman because the studio was attempting to retain the rights uh, to the Fantastic Four. So they had Corman make this film, and the film was never released, and it, it's kind of this legendary piece of crap, and it, they knew it was going to be a piece of crap, and they never put it out there. So Revelations was made uh, specifically to retain the rights of the Hellraiser franchise. Dimension didn't want to lose those rights, so they, they were obligated to put a film out. So they spent a few hundred thousand dollars, and they put together this film very quickly. And actually, it was written by the same guy who did Judgment. But the, my understanding is that uh, his script was butchered, and, and Dimension and the director kind of did their own thing. So Revelations uh, was the first Hellraiser film not to have Doug Bradley as Pinhead. And they got some other guy, and to be honest with you, I don't even remember his name, and it's really not even worth discussing because his Pinhead was atrocious. And the film itself was quite awful. It was very low budget. Uh, it was um, There was really nothing redeeming about it. It was just one of those things that you, you can obviously tell it was made for a specific purpose. Originally, that film was not supposed to even be screened, uh, other than with the cast and crew. It wasn't supposed to be seen by anybody else. It was just going to be used for legal purposes. Uh, but then, you know, Dimension, like any other company business, they got a little mercenary, and they went ahead and released it. Uh, and uh, basically were suckering in the Hellraiser fans. And I didn't fall for it. I didn't watch it until it hit Netflix because I heard the film was so bad. But it was released on demand, and it was released on video, and, and I, I don't think there was a single positive thing said about the film. Uh, it didn't even have the benefit of the Doug uh, Bradley cameo. It was just a, a straightforward, absolute piece of crap 
uh, that everybody was embarrassed about. And it really is considered to be the absolute low point for a franchise that wasn't exactly uh, populated with a lot of high points to begin with. So that's kind of the, the history of where the franchise is at. So needless to say, those of us who are Hellraiser fans, we've been, we've been kind of uh, sitting around and, and twiddling our thumbs, waiting for something to happen with this franchise that wasn't just a clear bastardization of it. Now, if you're a Hellraiser fan, then you've probably gotten your Hellraiser fix from some other places. For example, there's the Boom comic that's quite good and had Barker's input on it. And then also a couple of years ago, Clyde Barker released the Scarlet Gospels, which was basically his send-off of the Pinhead character. Um, but for those of us wanting a cinematic fix, um, we've had to wait. We've heard rumors of the Hellraiser reboot. Supposedly Dimension was going to eventually get this off the ground. Uh, but it kind of one of, the, one of these situations where it's a start and stop, start and stop. Rumors are out there, they persist, but nothing comes uh, of it. And then a lot of us were very heartbroken to discover that Clive Barker had actually returned to the franchise, had, had basically completed what, what apparently was a full script uh, of the, the Hellraiser reboot and then was basically um, rejected. His script was rejected by Dimension. So it's never a good sign when the, the man who created it, and he created the novella, he, 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 did, you know, he wrote and directed the original film, comes back and uh, his his script is rejected that's not obviously not a good sign so again hellraiser fans were all kind of sitting around and uh, depressed and frustrated and so um uh, a while back i had heard uh, talk about uh gary tunnicliffe's hellraiser judgment uh it sounded like this was a passion project of his and it sounded like that he was basically being given uh, a very very tiny budget to make another Ashcan film for Dimension, but this time around it was being made by somebody who actually loves the franchise. So there was at least a, a promising, uh, I guess you could say a promising kernel of hope that this guy was actually going to do something with, with this franchise other than just continue to milk it. So I didn't know this until recently, but uh, Gary Tunnicliffe actually did um, a short that's been on YouTube for years, and it's a it's a Hellraiser fan film, and it was it has some really good production values, and it's called No More Souls. And if you haven't seen it, I, I would really recommend that you go and check it out. But it's a really great little short where Pinhead is basically lamenting the fact that uh, there are no more souls for him to torture. He's living in a post-apocalyptic world where every human being has essentially been wiped off the planet, and he's just kind of lamenting this, and, and then there's kind of a little payoff at the end. But it's, it's actually very well done. In fact, I would argue that it's better than uh, the last several Hellraiser films, the direct-to-video films. So um, when I heard he had done that, um, that actually uh, instilled some, some hope and some confidence. And I had read a couple of interviews, and I had seen some things about this film. So for the last, like, uh, year and a half or so, we've been hearing about Hellraiser Judgment. And, of course... It finally, it was announced it was going to come out on Blu-ray and Video On Demand. Uh, it was a rel relatively short announcement. We found out in January that it was coming out in February. Uh, and as I already said, um, it landed yesterday. And um, I've had a chance to watch it. In fact, I had a chance to see it a little early. I got my copy uh, a little bit early. And I've got to say, I've got a lot of nice things to say about it. And I also have some criticisms that uh, I'm going to bring up as I'm going through it. But... It's an interesting film, and if you're a Hellraiser fan, and I mean a real Hellraiser fan, I'm talking about somebody who, you know, you've, you've read the, the Barker material, you've read the comics, you, you love this franchise, then there is a lot here to like, um, even amongst the, the low budget and the uneven acting and some of the other structural aspects of the film that I'm going to get into a little bit in this review, but it's, it's overall, I, I am very, very pleased with this film because it is a labor of love. And it's very clear to me that, that uh, Gary Tunnicliffe wanted this to be something special. And even though it's not in and of itself a spectacular film, it's a film that shows that he is, is very much interested in making Hellraiser something more than just a quick cash grab. And he has my respect for that. And uh, like I said, I'm going to get into a little bit uh, more detail about why I like this film so much. So in a lot of ways, Hellraiser Judgment is actually feels like two films. And I say this because there are there's the Hellraiser, Cenobites, Machinations of Hell storyline. And then you have this overarching detective storyline. And the problem with this overarching detective storyline is that it's incredibly derivative. It's something that feels very much like it's been borrowed from films like Seven, Silence of the Lambs, or Saw. And 
it's not very well done. But the bigger problem, too, beyond the, the, the fact that the script, in this sense, uh, feels a little stale, is because the budget just does not sustain um, what they're trying to accomplish here. And I'll give you an example. At the very beginning of the film, we, we are made privy to a crime scene. And the interior shots, everything feels very, very cheap, and it, it, it feels like, you know, you could have shot this at a friend's house. But beyond that, it's very jarring because you have the, the two cops who are these characters who are brothers who come in, and there's one other cop who shows up, and that's literally the only people at the crime scene. There's no forensics people. There's, there's no one else there. And, of course, this is very jarring because we know what a crime scene typically looks like, and that's not what a crime scene looks like. Uh, there's another... Uh, a couple of scenes later that are actually supposed to be in this police precinct and they have this exterior shot of this you know this precinct and then when you go into the precinct there's literally no other cops you you don't see any other cops any other people it's just these detectives and honestly it looks almost like a rented you know rented trailer inside and for their offices it's jarring and and it's i'm not doing this to 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 slam uh Tunnicliffe or anyone else i'm saying this because i think the 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 problem with this film and the biggest problem people are going to have with this film is that it does feel incredibly cheap and that his ambition, regardless of, of the script, simply um, exceeded uh, the budget, which obviously is, is very modest. And in, in terms of the budget, I want to make this clear, um, I understand that he was working with great restriction. Uh, my understanding is the budget is somewhere around three hundred seventy-five, less than $400,000. By comparison, the original Hellraiser, uh, they had a budget of about a million dollars. And also, Hellraiser was made in the mid-'80s, so if you actually adjust for inflation, by today's you know, uh, standard, Hellraiser would be about a $2.2 million production uh, budget, which still isn't very much, but imagine making a film for about a fourth of that or less, and you get a sense of what um, Gary uh, Tunnicliffe and company had to work with here. So I understand why these these budgetary restrictions are in place. I understand why the film often looks the way it does. But the problem is, is that I think it would have been better if he had attempted to kind of winnow it down. Because it's very jarring and it takes you out of the film very quickly. And that's unfortunate because the film opens up uh, with a spectacular sequence. And it's very well done and it's creepy and the makeup is good. And then you, you, you move on to this, this overarching detective plot that's really, it's, 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 it's middling, and you kind of slog through it, and you're just kind of waiting to get to the stuff uh, that deals with Pinhead and Hell and the Auditor and all of this kind of stuff. So that's one of the biggest problems with the film, and I want to kind of get the negatives out of the way because the budget is a major problem with this film. Uh, and, and some of that is, is there's nothing uh, Gary could have done about it. Um, but I do think he, he and his, his production crew should have tightened up the script should have tried to centralize it a bit more and maybe stayed away from this more ambitious idea when they didn't have the money to do it because it just it doesn't work uh, and it's there's some there's some things in the film that just they're they're almost cringe inducing or, or you're gonna laugh and it's unfortunate because it takes away from the stuff that he does right and I really want to focus on the stuff that, that Gary Tunnicliffe did right with Hellraiser Judgment this is not a movie that I'm gonna watch from beginning to end every time but it's a movie that I'm going to move uh, through certain scenes to get to the really good stuff because some of the stuff that he did in this film is really good and I say that again as a as a long long time lover of this franchise and I'm going to go ahead and I and I've said this on my uh, on my blog on my review I really do believe that that Gary Tunnicliffe has achieved some of the best highs of this franchise since Hellraiser 2, especially if you are interested in the mythology, especially if you're interested in kind of those inner workings of hell and the things that are going on. Uh, so he deserves a lot of credit for that, and that's why I'm willing to forgive some of these other problems with the film. Um, so I really want to get into the positives, but the, the, the big negatives are the budget, um, the script's a little wonky at times, some of the structural decisions... Um, and again, that, that budget is going to bleed through in every scene. The film feels cheap, and that's, again, some of that is just completely out of his hands. But I do think that there are some things I, I, I think he could have done and I wish he had done, because I think if he had tightened up the script, I actually think Hellraiser Judgment, if they had tried to make it more like the original film where you had kind of a, uh, you know, a centralized, small location, turn this into you know, kind of a, a singular, lo singular location type of experience, uh, would have been much more successful. Um, but setting all of that aside, let me now get into the positives and why I think this film deserves your attention, especially if you're a horror fan or especially uh, if you are a Hellraiser fan. So the film does a lot right. Um, 
and I again, I say this as somebody who is very much invested in the mythology of this franchise. And when you look at most of the direct-to-video Hellraiser films, the mythology is something that's neglected. There's really not much mythology there, and that's because most of these films, and all of these direct-to-video films, um, really aren't Hellraiser films. If you look at the first f- four films, um, and you understand that there's, a, there's an ongoing mythology, there's an ongoing story arc and, and storyline, and that these films are, are they're all, there's a connective tissue there. Uh, and then once we got into the the, the direct to video and and starting with Inferno, these films were very obviously made or were pre existing ideas where they kind of said, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna tack on, you know, a cameo by Pinhead or we're gonna tack on some Cenobites and we'll we'll throw a few scenes here and there and then we can call this a Hellraiser film. And that definitely is not the case here. Um, the film starts off in Hell. We see Pinhead very quickly. Uh, we're actually, um, and I'm going to talk more about Pinhead in a minute because obviously it's kind of a big deal when you have somebody who steps into the shoes of such an iconic character. Uh, but the first person I actually want to talk to is Tunnicliffe because he plays a very interesting character called the Auditor. And the Auditor is basically, uh, he wears dark sunglasses and he's in kind of this, this bloodstained suit and he has all these, these really nasty gashes all over his face. And he, he kind of looks like, and I, I mentioned this in my review, he kind of looks like a cross between a Cenobite and a Cenobite's victim. And he uh, has speaks kind of the, with this, this uh, kind of a halting, hesitant, uh, it so- sounds almost like a German accent. Um, and he is uh, very officious. And he, he basically is, is, is taking down the, the sins of a character at the very beginning, and, and you get a sense of this guy, and he's, he's very um, studious, he's very, um, he seems almost proper, even though he's, he's you know, obviously kind of functioning in hell, uh, but he's an interesting character, and Tunnicliffe actually does a great job, and again, I didn't know if he had any real acting chops, but he, he's great, uh, and actually, <laughs> and I say this with all due respect, I think he's better than, than um, some of the other actors in that film, um, and he comes off as very charismatic and very interesting. And, and I say that because, again, I think, and I think it's worth pointing out because this is a, a dense mythology filled with some very colorful and interesting characters. And when I first heard that the auditor was, was you know, he had mentioned the auditor and I'd heard some of the, the promo stuff and the talk of, of this character, I figured he'd be a throwaway character. It's like, ah, okay, you know, I'm here for Pinhead. We're all here for Pinhead. But actually, um, he holds his own. And he's a character that I would very much like to see... Um, further instituted uh, and instated into this mythology. So I, I, I think he did a great job. He's a very interesting character, very different than Pinhead. Um, I want to see more charismatic, but, but a, a bit more, um, there's a bit more personality in terms of he's not as stoic as Pinhead. He seems to be a little more nervous and skittish and uh, not quite as uh, sure of himself, even though he knows what he's doing uh, when he's dealing with his um, human victims. Uh, but I like him, and I like him as kind of this this uh, sidekick or this advisor to Pinhead. I think it's a they have an interesting dynamic, and I I, I give a, I give Tunnicliffe not only credit for for doing a good job with the acting, but creating a character who can stand shoulder to shoulder with a character like Pinhead. Um, let's talk about Pinhead. Um, that character is synonymous with Doug Bradley. Uh, Doug Bradley is Pinhead. Uh, his work on that character from the very beginning has established who Pinhead is and uh, I think without Bradley I think that character could have very easily faded into obscurity but I think Bradley brought something very unique and powerful to that character um, obviously in Revelations we had a different actor and like I said I'm not even going to really get into that it was, a, it was a mistake and there was nothing Pinheadish about that particular actor I think it was uh, looked like a guy who was in a you know cosplay or, or uh, dressed up for Halloween it just it didn't work on any level now that brings us to Paul T. Taylor, and there have been um, there have been some promo shots, and, and they'd shown us some pics earlier on, and he looked good in the makeup, uh, much much better uh, than we had seen in, in Revelations, and having a chance to, to actually see him in this film, uh, I really give it up to him. Uh, he made the character his own. Um, he doesn't emulate Bradley as much as he kind of does his own thing, but in the same line. Of, of who Pinhead was when Bradley did him, if that makes sense. He's not, he's not emulating Bradley, but he's definitely following Bradley's cues as to who Pinhead is in terms of being kind of imperious and regal and, and well-spoken. Um, we don't see as much of Pinhead in this as I would have liked to have seen. 
Um, not to say that he's a cameo, he's in it, he's a part of it, but again, the machinations of hell in this film and all of these, these underpinnings and all of the things that are going on in this, this darker universe that's kind of under the skin of our world is so much more interesting than that banal, boring, derivative, you know, seven knockoff that they, they kind of foist on us. And, I, and again, I really want to give Tunnicliffe uh, and company and the actors and everyone else involved credit for this because the world that they create is an interesting one. It feels at home with what Barker has done. It feels very much in line with what Clyde Barker has done, but it also manages to be unique. And I think the biggest thing here, and I think it's the most impressive thing, is that they've managed to add their own bit to the, to the mythology of Hellraiser. And I don't think any other film has done that since Bloodlines. And that in and of itself is an accomplishment. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that the film is perfect. That doesn't mean that this is the best thing ever. But it does mean that if you are a fan of the mythology, if you are a fan of these characters, if you are a fan of the premise, which again, uh, you know, going all the way back to Barker and his dark and brilliant mind, there's a lot to love about what works in this film, enough that I can forgive what doesn't work. And maybe part of that is desperation. You know, maybe part of it is the fact that we haven't had anything even remotely resembling a good Hellraiser film in, you know, 20 years. But I honestly believe that there is some really decent stuff going on in this film. And what I would like to convey is that Tunnicliffe deserves a budget. He deserves an opportunity to make a Hellraiser film with a few million dollars behind him, with, you know, real production values, with, you know, some script writers to help him kind of polish some things up. Um, if he wants to make a film that's going to require more than three people on screen, he'll be able to, to do that. He, he deserves that. Um, I think he's earned it. And I hope Dimension looks at this film, looks at some of the feedback it's gotten, and realizes, you know what, this guy did an amazing job with very little. Let's give this guy a budget. And speaking in a broader sense, I hope Dimension finally pulls their head out of their rectum and does something with this franchise. Because in some ways, despite the flaws, they don't deserve Gary Tunnicliffe. They don't deserve anyone who has any real passion. When they rejected Barker's script, they sent a very clear message that they don't understand or want to understand what this franchise is about. I'll be the first one to admit Hellraiser is niche. Even among horror fans, it's niche. It's not the easiest sell. But there's a reason why 30 plus years later, we're all sitting around talking about Hellraiser. There's a reason why I'm here right now talking about this franchise. Not just because of this film, but because... This film represents a genuine hope that there are people out there, artistic people, who are inclined to follow through with some of those broader ideas that Barker introduced in this franchise so long ago. And that's really, I think, the most important thing to take away from this movie is that wherever you come, whatever side you come down on, whether you think this film is, is, is good or not or whatever, it, is, it represents hope as silly or as corny as that sounds, that maybe this franchise can finally be resurrected and brought into the 21st century in a way that is meaningful and respects the source material and gives the fans something worth watching. And I say this again and I submit it, this is the first Hellraiser film that really has done something poignant with the mythology since Hellbound Hellraiser 2. So for that alone, regardless of the flaws, Gary Tunnicliffe, Paul T. Taylor, and everyone else associated with this film has my appreciation and my respect as a longtime Hellraiser fan. That's my recommendation. Check out Hellraiser Judgment. And if you don't like it, that's okay too.